بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم our first product has index k from 1 to n where n is a positive integer the kth term is real number x plus the square of sine k pi over 2n do a change of variables y equal to 2x plus 1 which means that x is y minus 1 over 2 take 1 half as a common factor so we have the product k from 1 to n of 1 half y minus 1 plus 2 sine squared k pi over 2n this can be written as y minus between brackets 1 minus 2 sine squared k pi over 2n this bracket is cosine 2 k pi over 2n which is k pi over n when one half is multiplied by itself n times we get the outside factor 1 over 2 to the power n the product of interest is 1 over 2 to the n product k from 1 to n y minus cosine k pi over n when k is equal to n this is y minus cosine pi minus cosine pi is plus 1 we can write the product as y plus 1 times the product k from 1 to n minus 1. Let's focus on this product here. This is y minus cosine pi over n times y minus cosine 2 pi over n all the way to y minus cosine n minus 1 pi over n. When we multiply, we get a polynomial of degree n minus 1. The polynomial is monic because the coefficient of y to the power n minus 1 is equal to 1. These cosines are the zeros or roots of the polynomial. We have n minus 1 of them. What is a function of x that is equal to 0 when x is equal to cosine k by over n? If x is equal to cosine k by over n, this means that n cosine inverse x is equal to k by. The sine of an integer multiple of pi is equal to 0. This motivates us to consider the function sine of n times the cosine inverse of x. We work with the typical principal branch of the inverse cosine function with the range from 0 to pi. This function is non-zero when the magnitude of x exceeds unity. It is equal to 0 with x equal to cosine m pi over n. Integer m is in this set from 0 to n. Note that if x is 1, the inverse cosine is 0, and sine of 0 is 0. If x is minus 1, the inverse cosine of minus 1 is pi, and sine n pi is also equal to 0. If this function is divided by sine of the cosine inverse of x, we have 0 in the denominator if x is 1 or minus 1. But we also have 0 in the numerator. These are removable singularities because we get a finite limit when x tends to plus or minus 1. And that finite limit is not equal to 0. Now the zeros of this function occur at x equal to cosine k by over n, where k is in this set between 1 and n minus 1. What is this function exactly? Some of you may recognize it as the Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind. But let's discover that it is indeed a polynomial without demanding any specific background. If n is equal to 1, we get 1. If n is equal to 2, we have sine 2 cosine inverse x. The numerator is 2 sine cosine inverse x times cosine cosine inverse x, that's x. We divide by the sine of the cosine inverse of x. We are left with 2x. If n is equal to 3, in the numerator we have sine 3 times cosine inverse x. That's 3 sine cosine inverse of x minus 4 times the cube of sine cosine inverse of x. When we divide, we get 3 minus 4 times the square of sine cosine inverse of x. This is equal to 3 minus 4 between brackets 1 minus the square of cosine cosine inverse of x. We have 3 minus 4 between brackets 1 minus x squared. When n is equal to 3, this function of x is 4x squared minus 4 plus 3, that's minus 1. Note also that this 4x squared minus 1 is equal to 2x times this 2x, the previous polynomial, minus 1. In fact, this is a general rule. We know that sine of a plus sine of b is equal to 2 sine of a plus b over 2 times cosine of a minus b over 2. Let's take a to be cosine inverse x times n plus 2, b to be cosine inverse x times n. So this sum is 2 times sine of the arithmetic mean of these two arguments. When we add them, we get 2n plus 2 times cosine inverse x. That's n plus 1 cosine inverse x when we divide by 2. We also get cosine, the difference, divided by 2. So we have cosine of 2 cosine inverse x divided by 2, that's cosine cosine inverse x, which is x. Now divide both sides by the sine of cosine inverse x. If this function of x is bn of x, then we have that bn plus 2 of x is 2x bn plus 1 of x minus bn of x. If these two are polynomials, then this must be a polynomial. A polynomial times 2x is a polynomial. Subtracting another polynomial will give us a polynomial. We have polynomials when n is 1 and n is 2. Therefore, by induction, for every n, this function is a polynomial. Pn of x, which is sine n cosine inverse x over sine cosine inverse x, is a polynomial of degree n minus 1. Since p of n plus 1 of x is multiplied by 2x, the next polynomial in the sequence has the coefficient of the highest power of x multiplied by an extra 2. 
Specifically, the polynomial of degree n has the coefficient of the highest power of x as 2 to the power n. If we take this polynomial, the n of x, and divide by 2 to the n minus 1, then we get a monic polynomial with degree n minus 1. The product of interest k from 1 to n of x plus sine squared k by over 2n, after doing the substitution x equal to y minus 1 over 2, is equal to 1 over 2 to the power n y plus 1, and then product k from 1 to n minus 1 y minus cosine k by over n. This part here is a monic polynomial with degree n minus 1. The zeros are at cosine k by over n with k in the set from 1 to n minus 1. This is exactly the same situation for this polynomial. Over the field of complex numbers, these two monic polynomials have the same roots. They are identical. This product here is 1 over 2 to the n minus 1 sine n cosine inverse y over sine cosine inverse y. The product of interest is this times y plus 1 over 2 to the power n. To write the product in terms of x, just replace y by 2x plus 1. This is the product of interest. Product k from 1 to n of x plus the square of sine k by over 2n is related to the Chebyshev polynomial of the second kind and is exactly given by x plus 1 sine n cosine inverse 2x plus 1 divided by 4 to the n minus 1 times the sine of the inverse cosine of 2x plus 1. The second problem is an infinite product, a product over positive integer n of 1 plus e to the minus 2 pi n. We can initially work with the logarithm of this product, which is the summation n from 1 to infinity log 1 plus e to the minus 2 pi n. As we will see, this sum can be written in terms of an integral. Consider big N a positive integer greater than or equal to 2. Function g is continuously differentiable. We have a sum small n from 1 to big N minus 1 of n between brackets g of n minus g of n plus 1 split into two sums, the first one small n from 1 to big n minus 1 n g of n, write the second sum using index n, do the substitution m equal to n minus 1, when n is 1 small n is 2, when m is big n minus 1 small n is big n, the summand is n minus 1 g of n. Because of this n minus 1, we can start the sum from 1, isolate the term corresponding to small n equal to big n, so we have this sum from 1 to big n minus 1, we also have this term big n minus 1 g of big n. When we combine this sum with that one with the negative sign, we get summation small n from 1 to big n minus 1 of g of n minus this term here. This part is minus big n g of big n plus g of big n. Merge this term with the sum. On the right hand side, we have summation small n from 1 to big n g of small n minus big n g of big n. Move this to the other side. We have this small n here, so we can start the sum at 0. Assuming that function g is continuously differentiable, we can write down this difference as integral x from n to n plus 1 of g prime of x, the first derivative of g. Since we have here g of n minus g of n plus 1, we need to put a minus sign. This n can be written inside the integral as the floor of x. The floor of x is x minus its fractional part. Now take the limit of both sides as n tends to infinity, assuming that the limit of this term here is 0. Summation n from 1 to infinity g of n is integral x from 0 to infinity minus the floor of x times the first derivative of g. For function g, we will use this function here, written with parameters alpha and beta. Beta is a positive real number. Alpha is a real number between minus 1 and 1. This function satisfies this condition. The limit as x tends to infinity of x times the logarithm is the limit as x tends to infinity of the logarithm over 1 over x. This is a 0 over 0 situation. We can apply L'Hopital's rule and obtain that the limit is indeed equal to 0. This means that we can apply this result here to this function. This part is the derivative of function g times minus 1. Write x minus the fractional part of x as x minus 1 half plus 1 half minus the fractional part of x. Split into two integrals. We have 1 over 1 plus alpha e to the minus beta x equal to summation g from 1 to infinity minus alpha to the power g minus 1 e to the minus beta x times g minus 1. We do term by term integration after replacing 1 half minus the fractional part of x by its Fourier series. We have a periodic function here with period 1. From minus 1 half to 1 half, the function looks like this. The Fourier series coefficient bn is equal to 2 over the period, which is 1, integral from minus 1 half to 1 half, 1 half minus the fractional part of x times sine 2 pi nx. This integral is equal to 1 over pi n. Using this Fourier series and this expansion, we do term by term integration. We get three classical integrals. Evaluating them, we get that summation n from 1 to infinity of log 1 plus alpha e to the minus beta x is alpha, summation g from 1 to infinity, minus alpha to the g minus 1, between brackets 1 over beta g squared minus 1 over 2g. 
then we have two alpha beta times a double sum over positive integers n and g of minus alpha to the g minus one divided by four pi squared n squared plus beta squared g squared. We can evaluate these sums. Note that summation g from one to infinity of minus alpha to the g divided by g, this is minus log one plus alpha. Summation g from one to infinity minus alpha to the power g divided by g squared. This is the dilogarithm of minus alpha. Our interest is the case when alpha is equal to one. The dilogarithm of minus one is minus theta of two over two. That's minus pi squared over 12. When we set alpha equal one and beta equal to two pi and use these results, we get that this summation is pi over 24 minus log two over two plus one over pi times this double sum written here after interchanging the order of summation. This sum can be written in terms of the hyperbolic cotangent function. In Euler's sine product formula, replace x by i x over 2 to obtain the hyperbolic sine function as a product. Take the logarithm of both sides, differentiate with respect to x to get this result here. Now, if we set x equal to 2 pi g, we get that summation k from 1 to infinity, 4 pi g over 4 pi squared g squared plus 4 pi squared k squared. So this is 1 over pi, summation k from 1 to infinity, 1 over k squared plus g squared times g. This is equal to one half the hyperbolic cotangent of pi g minus one over two pi g. This means that one over pi times the sum with respect to index n is one over g times between brackets one half the hyperbolic cotangent of pi g minus one over two pi g. We have these two functions of g. We can split the sum into two sums. The sum with g squared is one half zeta of two. This part is minus pi over 24. It goes away with this term. We are left with minus log two over two plus one half summation over positive integer g minus one to the g minus one over g, the hyperbolic cotangent of pi g. This sum was evaluated in a previous video. It is equal to pi over six plus log two over four. So this summation here is pi over 12 minus three log two over eight. The product n from one to infinity of one plus e to the minus two pi n is e to the power pi over 12 times two to the power minus three over eight.